Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I've owned this gavel for a solid month, and now it is my distinct pleasure to hand it over to your new president, Corey Mooney. So, ta da! Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. All right. Oh, this is a mark of <laughs> So with that, we'll start the uh, 956th monthly meeting of Anderson Telescope Makers of Boston. We have a really exciting guest speaker, Glenn Cole, who will be talking about the James Webb Space Telescope and actually making and polishing the mirrors for that. So it's very, very exciting. <laughs> Next, so we have some outreach committee, or sorry, yeah, uh, observing, observing committee. <laughs> the, the, the arrows and the arrows based on us. Well, good evening. Uh, Glenn and I are going to double team you all tonight. I left my glasses back where I was sitting. I'll look for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this is um, this is uh, Glenn's uh, comic for the week, and of course, Hubble hates the new James Webb Space Telescope and. All the astronauts have abandoned their their conventional telescope for a closer view. Um, if you, I don't know if you've been following the Webb Telescope, but it's been producing some amazing, um, amazing uh, images. Uh, you don't have to travel very far to see them either. So um, do do look at that stuff. Pretty good. That's pretty funny. You didn't like my kid one, my baby one. Huh? Oh, we're saving that. Oh, okay. Hey, say, I, the, say the quote. Yeah, I would like to die on Mars, not just on impact by Mario's friend Elon Musk. So, but they're just for your enjoyment. Either way, Mario. Either way, he'll he'll go on Mars. I'll start a fundraiser. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, it's not one of his, but the new the newest um, threat is the Blue Walker Three. Are you guys aware of that? The, the, aware blue, of that? the what? Blue Walker Three is a five G satellite. That has a solar panel that is something like That's not half the size of a football field. There you go. It's it's enormous, and they're expecting that once that this is this week it's in orbit now. This week they were talking about unfurling that antenna, and there will be times when they expect it to be far brighter than Venus when it picks up spectrum. Only one of them though. There's only one now, but there's a whole fleet of those they want to put up. Again, it's for it's for communication. It's for you know very similar to what Elon, Elon does to make a treaty on this. It has, something has to happen. 20 years. Because this. It, there's going to be nothing. You've heard me describe it a chain link fence around the Earth. Yeah. That's exactly what's being built now of satellites. And, you know, it doesn't affect visual observers, but the, the imagers and the big observatories will be crippled by it. I was doing some AB comparisons in my binoculars. I had an image intensifier on one side and a matching eyepiece on the other side. The stuff that was showing up in the intensifier, and then I go to look in the. You couldn't see it. Um, it was, I was like, holy cow, there's a lot more there's stuff, a lot of stuff there right than, than you're seeing. So. Actually, one minor correction for you, it, it doesn't affect us. Uh, the astronomers who work on the satellite uh, implication mm -hmm. should read it, okay? Because what they said is already there was a 10, because of the light that reflects off the satellites, you have a 10% increase of light pollution in the upper atmosphere mm -hmm. already. From just the little pieces that are up there now. Right. I'm going to just jump in on that. Um, not that this is a solution because it isn't, but I just did an article on that. It's called the 35 uh, Best uh, Double Stats. It's written by Phil Kane, and I published it in the article. And I've gotten 40 requests for that list. And the article that I wrote to get the most responses before them is one on this double star or a marathon that I wrote about a few years ago. 100 people replied to that. So it's like with all this light pollution and who knows what's happening with global warming and the misting up of the atmosphere, double stars are kind of like what a lot of people are turning to, which is a shame though for a deep sky observer, but yeah, that's the what's happening. Yeah. That the moon. The moon, I was gonna say, there's always the moon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, still letting them just That's right. That's and Crater Mario, but you said you, it can't be named unless you're dead, right? That's the rules by the IAU. Okay, just I didn't realize, I've, I've forgotten that uh, someone pointed it out that the um, uh, the Apollo astronauts were. That's made, right. Yeah. They, they, they made it, they had to have a unanimous vote for that. Just be careful going for the parking lot. You want to get straight <laughs> on. So listen, so while we're talking about observing, let's see what's up for this month. Um, so I'll go through this list pretty fast. The moon is last quarter on Monday. 
Uh, we have the Orion uh, meteor shower peaking in the pre-dawn hours of Friday the 21st. Venus is at superior conjunction on the 22nd, which is next week. That must be next week, yes? Yesterday morning, I have no pictures, so I can't prove this. Mm -hmm. Yesterday morning, I observed Venus 2.7 degrees away from the limb of the sun. Ooh. Is that your record? Oh my God. Pretty close. <laughs> next week, for sure, I'll have my record. You have a death wish. <laughs> <laughs> Make this. it eye rich or with a scope? Um, I was using a, a 12 inch scope, stopped down to two inches. I'm going to come to the next month's meeting with a cane. I beat him. I got closer. <laughs> Did you say a record or retina? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> personal <laughs> retina. Anyway, so I'm going to keep doing that until I can't, but um, don't try it unless you really talk to me and you, uh, and you really know what you're doing. Anyway, um, there's a partial eclipse of the sun uh, next week also, not visible from Boston. Our goal is at its minimum brightness at 10.23 p.m. on the 30th. And for Happy Halloween, there's the first quarter moon out for trick-or-treat as if you are so inclined. Um, our goal is again at minimum uh, a more convenient hour on Wednesday 11.02 at 7.12 p.m. There's a Europa Ganymede double shadow transit on the 2nd of November at a convenient hour, 8.22 to 9.01. Um, the torrid meteor's peak, uh, the south torrid's peak on 11.05, the bottom of the north torrid's peak at, uh, on the 12th. And the only reason I put those on there, and that's not a big shower, I wouldn't go lay out in the dark and watch them, but the torrids are known for beautiful fireballs. So if you happen to be outside over the next couple of weeks, three weeks, watch for, you know, pay attention to the sky and see if you don't pick up one or two of the torrid fireballs. They're really impressive. We did that. We and, did that. Um, so that's, that's why it's worth mentioning. Um, daylight savings time ends on uh, early hours of Sunday, 11.06. But on 11.08, there's a total lunar eclipse. It's a pre-dawn eclipse. And I have a slide for that in a second. Uranus is in opposition, 3.8 arc, uh, arc seconds in diameter, plus 5.6. Um, and the eclipse, uh, this is a, from Sky and Telescope, um, shows the circumstances of this eclipse. The partial eclipse begins at 3.09 uh, uh, Eastern time. Uh, and the moon will set for us while it's um, uh, in totality. So if you're interested, it's a nice photo op. Um, this is a sky safari view of what the eclipse will look like at about 6 o'clock that morning, Tuesday, November 8th. And you can see it's in the west-northwest, relatively low to the horizon. Um, but it might offer nice photo ops, with, you know, if you could be appropriate. Um, we should like to do that, right? Find a nice foreground object to um, photograph the moon. November 8th at 6. November 8th at 6. Right, the lights. Donna, See, Glenn has been president for like a month, and he's got the lights already figured out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a nice, there you go. That's a nice of you. And, and if you're out there, you might as well look at the planet you're on as while you're at. Um, that's it for the observing highlights for the month. Um, yeah, so let's look at the challenge. Go ahead, Colin, you want to talk this one up? Okay, yeah, you challenge. <clears throat> I'll be okay. I'll let you, I'll just say, all switch right. it. All right. all right, go ahead. Yeah, challenge actually isn't much of a challenge as far as visibility, but it's the open cluster M39 in uh, uh, Cygnus. And it's interesting, Cygnus is a large constellation right on the Milky Way, and it only has two Messier objects, that one being this one, and M29, which is a little bit fainter. And to find it, I would draw a line from Delta through Deneb, and then just you know, steer it straight across almost, and you get to Rho, Sydney. And the interesting thing about this, there's a, there's a closer review right here. Uh, in your low power field, this is almost reminds me of Antares or Altair, you have three stars, and it kind of leads you along a star path to there. For those of you that have looked at SS Cygni, SS Cygni is actually in the opposite direction, about the same distance down this way, so it's not too far from SS Cygni. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. I knew I knew Glenn was going to mention SSC. You got to plug it. Oh, that's a great staff. You had some of you, some of you in the club, like really promote it, and some of you've been looking. Joseph, Joseph Rothschild, who's in here tonight, he was he just notified me a couple of months ago that there was another outburst. So he's been following us. Are the outbursts running uh, still about every thirty days? Uh, fifty, I think it's probably it's back up to fifty. It seems to be normal again. It would have an, it would have an outburst. It would t just take a day to go from twelfth magnitude to eighth. And some of the uppers would stay viable for about maybe five or six days, and then it would slowly fade back down to 12th magnitude. 
and then there'd be another outburst, and that would be kind of short and would drop back down. So they're alternating. But about a year or so ago, this star just went crazy. The period was off. And one time it went up to about 10 and a half magnitude and didn't go all the way up. So it's an interesting star to follow. And it's an, it's, it, what, it, what, this is cataclysmic? Cataclysmic. It's like a binary star system. It's a white dwarf. I think the other star is something like the sun. So it's the same way that a nova works. It's just a lot quicker. So if you're interested in novas, this is kind of a neat one to look at because you're going to see an outburst every 40, 50 but days. The, the outburst happened when, at the at the. Uh, I accretion. think the accretion disk just gets loaded up and it just flares. Yeah, up. it's not it has to do with the stars. It has to do with the accretion disk where matter is falling into the white dwarf. So that's kind of makes it kind of cool. All right. Oops. There we go. So here are some pictures of M30. Like this is Mario's, I believe. Is that? Yep. Yep. And one thing I wanted to point get is there a pointer there at least? Yeah. There is okay. If you look up right near the top, there's a row of stars. Just yes. pointing that out, it's kind of neat. It looked like Kebbell's Cascade, but these are probably 11th to 12th magnitude stars. The cluster itself is very bright. All you see here is Milky Way background. So this is a beautiful cluster, and it's a shame in a way it is located right in the Milky Way. So for large, a large scopes, you do have a lot of extra stars added. Uh, it's one of the nearest of the Messier objects. The only ones, one that was that are closer would be the Pleiades and uh, the Beehive Cluster, M44. And you see how nice they look away from the Milky Way. If this cluster were put out there like they are, it would really stand out. At fifth magnitude, it should be naked eye and uh, dark sky areas. And it's about the size of the full moon. That's Mario's picture. you have any uh, notes on that, Mario? Uh, I took that through my refractor, six inch. That gives a little more than a, it's a degree vertically and 1.2 degrees uh, horizontally. Hey, one thing I'm going to point out since I'm a double star fanatic, uh, I made three observations of this over the years, one way back around 1977 with a little three inch Edmund reflector. I when I was doing a survey of all the Messier objects with a small telescope, I think I used a three inch again, a little F6 this time. And then recently, just a few weeks ago, uh, to make a sketch you'll see in just a little bit. And when I compared all three photo images, one of the things I noticed was right here, close double star, and that actually is a catalog double star. It's called Iron 78, I think it is. I'm not sure who the discoverer was. I could not, going through the Washington double star catalog, see the name of the discoverer. But anyway, it's about eight, it's about eight and a half and ninth magnitude for as far as the, con, the, the, uh, the component stars, 50 arc second separation, so it's pretty wide. Yes? Of greater importance, there's a dark, uh, oh, dark light. Yeah, I think that showed up on, um, we'll go to the next slide. Doug Paul has an image. Is Doug here tonight? I didn't see him. Yes, I am. Yes, I'm oh. here. Go ahead. Give us the information. Okay. Um, this was uh, about uh, 20 minutes total of 30-second uh, exposures. 400-millimeter um, lens, that's 142-millimeter aperture. Uh, it's a pretty easy object to photograph. Um, one, I'd like to make a comment uh, referring back to a uh, previous object that there had been discussion about uh, difficulty of bright, um, particularly planetaries like the Turtle Nebula. And uh, I checked my first sub to uh, see if it's overexposed and, uh, and lower the exposure as necessary. And then I'm very careful in my processing chain not to saturate because uh, otherwise a lot of the uh, brighter objects get, uh, get blown out. Uh, things like uh, the center of the Andromeda Nebula, on many, many images, you see the centers blown out, and again, by being careful with your exposure or using high dynamic range techniques, you can, you can keep it in the picture. So, okay, so, soapbox off. <laughs> Good, there's a double star, shows it very nicely. And you can see the dark lines. Yeah, same thing. The, the next image is by Chris Elledge. Uh, from the from middleman the middleman yes Chris yeah. middleman yeah and actually this is so dark you, you lose some of the stars that you can see in the original image um i have this on the website if you want to take a uh, if you want to download the full size you can take a good look at it um the dark yeah the dark lane on the lower left this is um this was an experiment for me i combined a uh, five minute exposures with the the three the three um photometric filters, R, V, and B. And I also took one second exposures uh, to make it where I could not, to, and I combined them, like like uh, Doug said, um, to, HDR technique. Yeah, with the HDR. So that, that kept it from saturating the stars. 
Um, Beautiful color. That's good. I like the way that came out. They're hot stars, so those colors would be pretty yeah, true. Very blue. And this, so there are only about 30 stars in this cluster. You basically got the cluster right there in that picture. What I was going to say about um, open clusters, galactic clusters, if, you, if you're thinking to yourself, well, I find them rather ho-hum, because sometimes they look that way. Play around with your system. If you have eyepieces that you can pop in and out, um, sometimes all it takes is just the right magnification and the right field of view to frame an open cluster in such a way that it becomes actually really quite pretty to look at. Um, I've only recently come back around to open clusters, and that's what I find I need to do, is just to play with eyepieces until I find that, that sweet spot that makes it worthwhile to go look at open clusters. So try that. If you haven't, if you've given up on them, don't. Try it. Yeah, another surprise I had when I was processing this is there's, there's a pair of galaxies in the bottom right of the, of the cluster, which showed up in red. Oh, the seen Yeah, those yeah. two right there. Yeah, nice. I was not expecting to see any given that I was shooting through the Milky Way. Right? Mm -hmm. You said that was five minutes? Yeah, those, these are, these are yeah. it's six, five minutes of each of the photometrics. And that's why you got that, because I, I stopped at 30 seconds because the stars were being blown out. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the reason I, I, I wanted this experiment where I had the really long exposures and the really short ones to see yeah. if it would work out. Yeah. By the way, you notice that they do talk about the triangular shape of this cluster, which is something I made a note on when I was sketching this uh, the last time around. Definitely triangular shape. And that's about the size, again, of the full moon. That whole Actually, moon. with his deep exposure, you can really see that it's really riddled with dark mm -hmm. nebula all over the place. Yeah. You'll, you'll see this object in your finder scope if you're going to do it visually. It's easy to find. And like Lance said, when you're with, with um, I said, Sydney. Right now. Yeah, I wonder if that dark nebula is associated with the cluster because it mm -hmm. really new stars. I was going to ask if that dark nebula is it got backgrounds all up or is it one of the clusters? Running into the birthplace? They may not know. That's a hard, I think that, I, I think if they were associated with the lit up, it probably <clears throat> they were close enough. I think True. the distances to dark nebula are <clears throat> challenging to determine. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another one coming up next month. Oh, well, this is Glenn's sketch. This is the sketch. I mean, this is with a, a 60 millimeter refractor. I made this the other day. Uh, the field is reversed because of the way refractor telescopes work. But there's that double star again right up there in the top. And uh, not too much to say about it, except I saw about 20 stars, which is about two thirds of the whole cluster. And that was with that little 60 millimeter refractor. So nice. it's a nice object. Again, it would be really, this would be a stunning object if we're just away from the Milky Way out in a, a, a kind of an isolated area like the Pleiades are. I believe, oh, we got the one for next month. Our yeah, preview. Yeah, going for next month. And there it is. And this one is a toughie because I've already tried it. This is NGC 7184. It's a galaxy in Aquarius. Apparently it's a barred spiral type galaxy. And if you notice the location, uh, it's in the constellation Aquarius. And when I tried it out, one of the things, when I'm using a telescope, I do visual observing, and I star hop to my location. And I'll start with low power just to get the field. Now I'll go to a higher power to increase contrast so I can see the object itself. The problem with this particular galaxy is there were no bright stars. And for me, that means maybe 12th magnitude, 10th to 12th magnitude that I could see in my 10-inch scope. There was nothing there in the field. So when I saw a fuzzy little patch, I really couldn't anchor on what, if I was seeing things, there'd be a little fuzzy patch might appear here and a fuzzy patch there. And that happens whenever I'm looking at a faint galaxy. But usually there's a star or two that I can pinpoint. If that fuzzy patch keeps appearing in that same area relative to those stars, I know I've got it. But in this particular case, there was nothing in that field of view. Also, this is a very low uh, declination, minus 20 degrees. So I had light pollution from Worcester, which made it even more difficult. Uh, but you can say, people report seeing this with a six inch telescope. I think, again, you have to be out in a dark sky location to do that. So this is going to be a challenge. Uh, your images might have an easier time. And uh, there is a ring somewhere around in here that, that I think was created with the, the rotation of the galaxy and star formation and so forth. You might be able to pick that up on images. I believe that is it. So uh, I was just going to add this, though, there's a, before you end it. You know, there's, a, there's a quote that's oftentimes a, uh, given to Michael Covington, who um, will tell you that every galaxy, and this probably goes for every object in the sky, deserves at least 15 minutes of your time. If you're going to look at it visually, you know, the images just point it and go. If you're going to try and find these faint fuzzies visually, spend some time with it. Let your eye grow accustomed to the field. And when you see that first ghostly image, um, 
keep at it because the longer you look at it, the more obvious it becomes. And before you know it, you're all like, how did I even miss that 20 minutes ago? A nice trick with faint objects is to just tap the telescope ever so slightly. Just jiggle the field of view so that, because the eye is very good at picking up motion under low light conditions. And so like that's a nice trick. Looks like there's a background of galaxies there. So yeah, there are some. Yeah. A nice deep image. Oh yeah, right there. Yeah, there's, one right there. there's another one. It looks like something there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it should show up on your images. That, that looks like one down at the corner down there, too. No. Yeah, this one right yeah. here? Yeah. yeah. We're not, I'm going to do a deep image on this one. We're not getting it with the middleman. We hit the, we hit the south wall trying to get it already. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what, is that where the roof would come No, that, that was, well, that was one of the nights. <laughs> yeah. I think that's it, right? I was just going to say, I just want to get on the camera here so my wife knows I was here and doesn't think I was here. <laughs> so, this is Phillips Auditorium on the campus of Harvard University. It's an at mob meeting. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll watch for him. Yeah, the, the cooler with the beers in the back. All right, thanks, everyone. Hey, keep looking up. Good night. <laughs>
on which the characters are loosely based. Okay, very good. <laughs> Enough of that. Um, yes, this is a story about the web, the mirror makers of the JWST. And as your guide, a bit of my history is shown on this page. It all started uh, for me about 40 years ago with this, the system shown in the upper left. This was my first job with my father, also a mirror maker. And we worked with Dr. Charles Towns, the Nobel laureate and co-inventor of the laser. We polished the two meter flats and 1.65 meter parabolas for the three, two of the three systems shown here. These are also known as infrared spatial interferometers. Further, you can see my mirror making work on what I call the dark side in the lower left. I can't talk too much about it, but these systems employed large lightweighted glass mirrors. And in the center area, we can see the Hobby Eberly Telescope and the SALT, the South African Large Telescope. These are both multi-segmented telescopes. And of course, foremost on my mind, the James Webb Space Telescope. And in preparation for Webb, there was uh, what we call AMSD, that's the Advanced Mirror System Demonstrator. This was a competition of sorts of telescope arch architectures. Central within that architecture was the telescope mirror segment designs. I was working at Eastman Kodak at that time, and on the left, you see our beautiful entry. This is a low temperature fused glass honeycomb sandwich mirror. The material is a Corning ULE, that's a titania doped eusilica, what we call a zero coefficient glass. And this was a real work of art just in the creation of the blank before any polishing. And on the right, we see the competing mirror that's an open back lightweighted beryllium substrate. And the engineer there gives you a sense of the scale of these uh, segments for AMSD. This was also quite involved just in the creation of the substrate or the, as we call it, the blank. This was a very important decision and it was central to the JWST telescope design and drum roll, the winning design was the ball beryllium approach. This was as exciting for some as it was completely devastating for others. And in the central performance box, I won't go into too much uh, depth here, but for the nerds amongst us, I think there's many, uh, we can see the earth shattering specifications, not for the faint of heart. And so with that, I was personally fortunate enough to be selected to lead the polishing team out west and soon found myself as the chief engineer in charge of beryllium mirror polishing out at what I will call Thompson Free Freeform. Yes, I had transitioned from one team to the other and to the beautiful and complex world of beryllium mirror polishing. In the early days at Thompson, and these are what I, I know as the good old days, we had a lot of work ahead of us in what's called facilitization, preparing for the program. Not only did we need to create custom polishing facility, but also all of the equipment and tooling as well, polishing machines, uh, the metrology or, or the measuring equipment, handling uh, system, et cetera. And here we see the proud parents taking baby Webb out for a stroll around the block and the neighbor asks for a better look at Baby Webb, and wow, he is surprised. And here we see the details uh, relative to the primary mirror. It consisted of 18 segments. There was three unique prescriptions, as we call them, or surface shapes. Uh, you can see them here, they're A, B, and C. We call them A, B, and C, and so did NASA. Uh, and the primary mirror array and gaps, very small gaps between them. Of course, the, um, the telescope is designed to be what we call co-phased, so that essentially the 18 surfaces um, within, within a handful of nanometers are essentially uh, looks to the cosmos like a single surface. And after a solid year and a half, we were able to call the facility complete, and it was a big affair with all of the partners 
Ball Aerospace, Northrop, and NASA attending the dedication. It was a proud moment for all of us. Um, the team had really outdone themselves. It was, it was a tremendous effort. And we had created a top-notch um, facility really from the ground up. Um, and as we would find out later, though, there were still many nuances in beryllium polishing that stood between us and the finish line. And here we have, uh, it's, it's a beautiful uh, look down, down the shop, the optical shop. We see the seven large polishing machines. These beasts were created uh, specifically for web. We started with a huge uh, Johnford machining center base and then outfitted it with a variety of proprietary grinding and polishing heads. In the upper photo, you have a close-up of the, the first machine. That's what we call LCP01. And in the lower photo, we see essentially the shop floor, the optical shop floor. Um, if you look closely in the lower photo, you can see what I call the command center right near, right under the flag. That's where my desk was, along with the process engineers. Uh, they were the drivers of the JWST car on this one. And that's where a lot of the decisions, uh, polishing decisions were made. And the beryllium blanks, the, the blanks, of course, as you probably know, were made out of uh, beryllium, which is an amazing material, if you look carefully. Uh, it's the fourth element, number four in the periodic table. And this was a specially formulated O30 beryllium. It was formulated specifically for web, and it represented a, a very big step forward in terms of material properties. It was more isotopic than any beryllium type at that point in time. The bools, as we call them, the giant um, chunks of beryllium, were created by what's called hipping, and it's a process where the beryllium powder is placed in a container, and heat and pressure are applied. It's something similar to uh, what you might call centering. And after the creation of these O30 material bools, um, the coefficient of thermal expansion, we call it CTE, is near, we found it's, it's really special, nearly zero at the end use temperature of uh, 40 Kelvin. The room temperature CTE is not that great. It's not very good. Um, but as the temperature goes towards absolute zero, the CTE also asymptotically also goes towards zero. Afterwards, the bulk material uh, was removed as shown here, and you can see the open back rib structure. This is what we call an open back lightweight. This blank is a 90% lightweight. So 90% of that beryllium has been removed, as you can see there. Um, another interesting, if painful, property of beryllium is that it is toxic to humans. Specifically, if small particles are inhaled, the person can be stricken with what is a debilitating disease known as beryliosis. And there were strict protocols and we hired a beryllium safety officer to help keep us safe. We also had periodic blood tests looking at the left cartoon. Uh, this was actually not funny. This is just sort of representing what happened. We, I remember the day we had, we had a blood test. We had to get three vials to check for uh, if we were sensitized, if we were having any issues with with the beryllium exposure if any and uh i just remember the day when uh our safety guy told us that they lost these samples in the mail and i don't know about anybody else but i don't like giving blood that often but we all did it for the cosmos we did it for web but we were dedicated the cartoon on the right is uh, also uh, again something i overheard this conversation uh, some of the, the operators are i guess we call them uh, technicians the hands people I overheard them in the smoke hut um, talking about how one, one was recommending to the other that we ought to have, uh, you ought to wear a double glove. You ought to double glove during cleanups to avoid the brilliant. And of course, uh, the other guy said, you do realize there's more brilliant in, in your smoke here than there is in the entire shop. So that was, that was pretty funny. And the other, the fear of pitting. Now for optical processors, the fear of pitting of beryllium, it really hung over our heads for the entire duration of the project. Uh, for direct polishing of beryllium, um, the pitting really depended, these are very small, really depended on the slurry chemistry. Um, if, if we adjusted the slurry chemistry, you know, in one direction too much, 
you could get pitting. But if you adjusted in the other direction, the progress, the polishing removal rate was incredibly low. So we had to try to balance things out and try not to get pits because our greatest fear is that we'd have to go back to grind. So after we invested a lot in the optical fabrication, we did not want to have to take that step backwards to go back to grind and to remove the pits. And in the center, this is our Keon's microscope system, which was used to characterize the pits, if any, and to return precisely after the run to take a look and see if there's any progression of the feature. So we had a, a very good system for returning to any features that might, that might be there. And again, they were, they're very small, very infrequent, but it's something that really consumes us. And the other, like I said before, the other thing is that the beryllium is a tricky material. Um, I grew up uh, optical fabrication of glass and glass ceramics, as probably most of you are aware. That's uh, fairly, fairly known, fairly well known. Uh, brilliant polishing is, is direct brilliant polishing uh, is a little is a little different. It's it's trickier. Uh, chemistry is proprietary, but let me just simply say that if, if things are too strong, if the slurry is too strong, you, you risk pitting, as I mentioned before. And if it's too weak, then the removal rate slow down to just a ridiculously slow um, removal. So we had to find that sweet spot uh, and keep ourselves um, making progress on these beautiful mirrors. Um, so we always had this temptation to to play with the slurry, but you know I, I really was keeping an eye on that so that we didn't get too creative and, and cause trouble. In, in this photo, we actually see this is a photo of. Uh, a dye penetrant inspection of what's called the tertiary mirror. Of course, there's not just primaries, we have a secondary and a tertiary. Here they're looking specifically on the tertiary and we tried dye penetrant on it to give us a better uh, way to look at any pits that might be developing. And even with this, it was still a very difficult and challenging uh, job to, to really see and manage uh, these very tiny um, microscopic really pits. And amongst all the hard work, there was an uh, occasional light moment. And to, pre to preface, uh, let me just say that, first of all, I don't get out much. And second, I'm starved for entertainment. So the, the pitting situation was just really the perfect setup to ask the new process engineer to go get some beryllium putty. Um, let me be clear. There's, there is no such thing as beryllium putty. Only the opportunity for us to ask the new process engineer to go get the brilliant buddy for this segment uh, A6 that had fits. So that was a little, a little uh, nerd humor there. And the engineering development unit, as, as we called it, the EDU, it was, it was uh, really a workforce for uh, process development. The idea is that we would keep it in front of the other segments by six weeks. The problem with that, that's the, what we call the EDU buffer. The problem with keeping it in front by six weeks is the EDU also ran into all the potholes uh, on the journey. So, so you know, we, we had this uh, development unit. It was it was a an A type segment, and it was in front. But it we also found all of the anomaly. It was the first through the process, and there were some things that we found along the way. So it was a, quite a challenge to keep it um, keep it in the lead, and eventually. Uh, that that buffer, as we called it, was down to just a couple of weeks, and it was never satisfying. We really wanted it to be much further uh, in advance of the what we call the production segments. And here we have a, a look at some um, uh, early optical fabrication that is grinding, and we see a lot of information on this page. But you see on the left a uh, um, smooth out grind of of one of the segments on the large. Uh, machines, uh, in this case, grinding machine. You see the progression in the chart in the middle that's uh, showing us how the surface figure was progressing. And just for reference, uh, just remember that when we get these um, segments, they're within 100 microns of the prescriptive shape when they arrive at our shop. And the other thing to, uh, for context is it took us over two years to, um, to finish, um, to finish a, a, a segment. So I'll, you'll, you'll understand why in, in a bit here, but there was a lot of things that uh, took a lot of time, a lot of things that were anomalies, as we call them, that, that helped um, basically push that schedule. Okay, let's see. Um, 
Yep. The other thing that, that, that turned out to be one uh, uh, an anomaly was just how much stress was in uh, in the blanks when we received them. And you say, well, who cares about that except that for this material, for beryllium, there's something we have that's called a property called micro yield. And if you exceeded that micro yield limit in whatever you did, whether it was handling or grinding or whatever, the segment would be unstable over time. And of course, for a process engineer, stability was what we were trying to do. We wanted to create accurate surfaces that of course were stable. And here we see um, also a, this is a very special uh, CMM, temperature controlled, good to a fraction of a micron. Um, we had ruby tip probes in, in most cases in, in terms of mechanical measurements. And we use these quite a bit early on and, and really throughout the process. Um, we use them on the front surface, but as I mentioned with the micro yield and the stresses, we needed to understand the, the global stress state of the, of the mirror also. And to be able to do that, we actually had to measure the backside monuments to keep track of the overall stress state of every segment. And here underneath, this is an interesting view. On the CMM, if you kind of went down low, as the photographer did here, you see the, the rib structure. So that gives you a little context of what we are dealing with here. This lightweight rib structure, I mean, there's, there's these very thin ribs. And, of course, you had to be very uh, careful um, at all times. And we developed a handling system to, to keep things safe. And here, uh, some in-process metrology. For those of you who make your own optics, you probably recognize um, some of these images in terms of, of uh, optical fabrication. These are the same, these are different ways to represent an early surface figure. Uh, you see on the left there, uh, those are what we call fringes, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. The fringes um, are basically equal height or isoclines you see there, and, and the interesting thing on the left, you also see these little bumps. Now, I don't, I'm not sure if you know what those are, but we call that quilting. And the quilting is in response to the polishing pressure uh, in between the ribs, the beryllium um, top sheet, if you will, is pressed down. And when the pressure is removed, they bump up in what we call quilts. And you actually see those little quilted features on this, of course, those are all gonna to have to be removed in op optical fabrication. This is quite early, but I thought it was interesting to see that. And on the right, that's a more conventional look, um, sort of a, a height, height map, if you will, of, of the early uh, processing step. This is for the EDU. And the thermal cryo chamber. Um, again, this relates to the micro yield. One thing that was really misunderstood in the beginning, at least uh, the, the uh, magnitude of it, was this property that we call micro yield. And for beryllium, again, if you exceed that micro yield, the substrate is of course unstable. And of course, for people that are making accurate surfaces, uh, that you have to pay attention to because these, this, this kind of stress could be unstable over years, literally years. If you don't relieve that stress and, and track it and manage it, uh, you don't have a stable shape or a stable substrate or a mirror even. So basically here uh, we had to spend a lot of time in the cryothermal chamber managing that stress. And it's, I, I can't go into the details because of proprietary, but it's basically cycle that it, it's not only hot, but it also goes down towards cryogenic temperatures and uh, doing, doing things in that way, we can actually manage that stress. And we we're also able to use this over the weekends. We mostly had a 24-5 operation, but we would run the cryo chambers over the weekend. And we knew before the contract was awarded that we would have to do all this cryo cycling. That was not a surprise. But what was a surprise, and are not known to us, at least in the very beginning, was how much stress came with these beautiful blanks from day one. As soon as we opened that crate, uh, they had a lot of stress. And we actually refined the process later such that the uh, thermal cycling uh, on the front, front end of, of fabrication um, would be able to, to manage that, that, um, that stress. 
handling. Now, uh, at first glance, you look at this picture, it looks kind of precarious. You've got some people holding these segments, uh, but let's, let's back up a little bit. Um, in spite of the size, the blanks were easily, easily lifted by two trained technicians. Uh, the tricky part was avoiding touching those delicate ribs that I talked about on the open back rib structure on the back. Um, we did plenty of practice with surrogates, of course, before we touched prime hardware. But in any case, we determined we needed um, a, you know, a more mechanized handling approach. And I'll, I'll talk about that coming up. Uh, note in the background, uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but we're wearing uh, respirators. These are called PAMs or personal air monitors. In the early stages, we wore these uh, PAMs in order to look at the processes and our exposure, if any, to beryllium. So we had uh, filters and we would wear these um, air monitors in the beginning and we would adjust our processes and monitor any exposure so that we were all safe, of course. And here's hand flipping. And yes, there were occasions early on when we flipped segments by hand and myself included. Uh, nothing bad ever happened, but shortly afterwards, as I mentioned, we developed um, the fixture transfer station, which I will show in a minute. And please note, these, the expressions on these operators' faces are not accurate. Remember what I said, everybody's photoshopped, okay? So believe me, no one was smiling, no one. We were, we were very serious. And the fixture transfer station, as we see here, this is a shot looking at a segment uh, being held by the fixture transfer station. And uh, what, this is me here, although it doesn't look like me because it was a, they changed the head on it, so it's photoshopped. Uh, but basically this would allow us to um, do some transfers. If we, for instance, wanted to change carriages from a cryo carriage to a standard carriage, this would happen at the fixture transfer station. So that really uh, helped reduce the risk of handling. And yes, it's a messy business. As we look carefully at this photo, uh, it was messy. And you can see what we call the dark gray material. That's what we call swarf. And, and as you might imagine, inside the swarf, there's beryllium particles and spent abrasive. Also, you see the plastic uh, skirting to keep things manageable. And cleaning, there was a huge amount of time. We spent more time cleaning and more time in the crowd chamber than we did actually polishing and grinding. Um, so there was a huge amount of time cleaning. And after anything, whether it was a grinding or a polishing run, we needed to clean. And the trick here, the trick to keep us safe was we never let this dry out. The slurry, the swarf as I called it, is never allowed to dry out and our procedures and our processes ensure that so that the particles would not become airborne and put us at risk. So the cleaning was, was very important, keeping it wet was important, and it was almost always a two-person affair. As you can see, these are not small mirrors. These, these are sizable, sizable um, optics. The process engineers, as I mentioned, at the command center, which we see uh, in the cartoon on the left, that was, uh, they're really the drivers of the car. They were in charge of, of creating what we call the run files, whether it was for grinding or polishing. They would take the metrology data and they would come up with a run for that uh, optical fabrication step. And uh, I had, we had to watch everybody and make sure that we were paying attention to the details because uh, the small things matter. And on one, one day, now there's a cartoon, but this, again, this is, ties into a story. One day, midway through the program, we had a visit from the chief scientist for Webb, and he opened up with an impromptu speech out in the optical shop, and he was giving us plenty of praise for creating the web mirrors, and it was very nice. Um, but he also shared what kept him up at night. And he told us, frankly, he feared that the five layer sun shield would somehow miss a malfunction and make a moot point of how fantastic our beryllium mirrors were. And he said, he worried about that, even though it's much simpler than our mirrors, uh, he worried about the sun shield. And even though it's simpler, it's still critical to the mission. So if the sun shield were to malfunction, he said, 
your beautiful mirrors would be for naught. And so I also, well, all the process engineers, we didn't know the engineers. We didn't, we, we worried also about the sun shield because we're making, we're, we're working so hard on the mirrors. Um, we worried that something like a pulley, a cable would come off of a pulley or something like that. And we'd have one big wrinkled mess. And I talked with my lead process engineer, Norbert, and I said, you know what, if this happened, I would go out there and I would untangle the darn thing. I'll clean up my language. I would untangle the darn thing myself if necessary. And he looked me in the eye and said, no, you won't. You can't get back. It's a one-way trip. And I told him, and this, this, is, this is the truth. I said, I don't care. I'll go out and fix the darn thing and happily float off into cryogenic space afterwards with a smile on my face. And that's how, that's how we felt about Webb. We were so dedicated, we were irrationally dedicated to, to this telescope. Um, and here we, we see the process engineers doing what I call walking the tightrope of mirror making. And we had to worry about a lot of things. As, as I mentioned, micro yield, pitting, edge roll, to name a few. We had to keep an eye on all of these things. And we really felt it was, a pre, it was precarious. We, we were always on the edge of, of failure. And we were, we were just, it was just the nature of what we were doing. There was a lot of really challenging things in front of us. Now, direct polishing of beryllium, that also requ required a lot of uh, what I'm going to call finesse. The slurry details, of course, you want to balance out the removal with the risk of pitting. And here in this photograph, we see um, we're preparing for what we call a smooth out polished run. And the polished segments, once they were polished up, oh, this beryllium was a beautiful sight to behold. This is direct beryllium uh, polishing. And there, there's, there's the mirror surface that you see. It's, there's no coating on this. This is, this is beryllium. And this beryllium really polished up nice. Uh, of course, for the science, we, we will, of course, need to gold coat in order to achieve our science goals. And another thing that's important to realize is we're making these on the earth and the telescope doesn't need to look good on the earth. It needs to look good at Lagrange too. It needs to look good at 40 Kelvin. And so for reference of uh, uh, 40 Kelvin, just think about liquid nitrogen, that's about 77 Kelvin. So this is colder than liquid nitrogen where this surface needs to look good. And what we had to do was after uh, the initial polishing, we would ship these to Huntsville, Alabama, to the XRCF cryo chamber, and we would establish what is known as the cryogenic back out. In other words, how did the shape change in going from room temperature to 40 Kelvin? And that was the other thing interesting is that was a segment specific back out. Each and every segment that we made had a different cryogenic back out. Here we see, I believe this is the EDU, you see room temperature shape looks not too great. It's about 103 nanometers. This is early polishing. Um, but when it went to uh, cryogenic temperatures, it uh, got pretty, pretty good. So the cryogenic backouts uh, for beryllium were, were quite, quite uh, uh, repeatable and, and manageable as long as we applied them directly. So there, again, the surfaces did not look perfect at room temperature, but you needed to apply um, some back outs. We had the cryogenic back out, we had some other back outs to gravity, of course. Uh, these segments need to look good in zero gravity. And of course we made them in one G. And so we had to also account for, for that as well. And edges. And if anybody there is, is making their own telescopes, they know about edges. And we started with blanks that were hexagonal. We didn't start with round, round blanks. We started with hexagons and the edge relief on, on web was five millimeters. The surfaces had to be good to within five millimeters of the edge. And I'm proud to say that most of the time we were very, very near the bevel, probably a couple millimeters from the actual bevel right there, right there at the edge. And it was, it was a lot of work to manage those edges, but the one thing we didn't want to do is we didn't want to roll the edges. I mean, that was a disaster. If you roll the edge, you have to remember, you have to take the entire central region down if you roll those edges. So that was something that was uh, one of the things we had to really be careful of. 
and the metrologists. If anybody there is using interferometers or, or knife edge full call testers, you, you understand these are, these are amazing people. These are the map makers, if you will. And they use the CMM, the Shack Hartman, and other optical tests to measure the surfaces during the processing. This information, shape information, would be delivered to the process engineers who, of course, as I mentioned, would come up with what we call a run file. So there was a bit of mystique associated with metrology because they, they were very smart and clever and doing all this interesting nerdy stuff. Um, they really did not, uh, they didn't need a Ouija board or a crystal ball, but there were a lot of subtleties, as I mentioned, the cryo back out, gravity back out, the test set back out, all of these things had to be accounted for. So they were, they were the magicians amongst us. And here is a bird's eye view of the optical test. This is uh, looking down on our, the, the central part of our testing. Uh, it was basically a CGH uh, interferometer, if you will. And you can see that there's a hold mirror. So the, the path was folded. And there was, there was really a lot to this. But basically, I want to give you a sense of the metrology and this whole, um, you're looking down, there's, there's two gigantic granite slabs uh, that are holding us um, in the um, temperature-controlled uh, uh, metrology room. And here's a, uh, looking at it, the mirrors under test. On the left, you see a uh, polished mirror, and, and it's, that's in the um, optical test. And the magic happens, at least in my world, as an optical engineer, with uh, the magic is the CGHs. So uh, those are uh, you know, computer-generated holograms, or what we call CGHs, and they're diffractive optical elements. And they are used to establish the reference wavefront this reference is interfered with the light off the mirror surface. And as you know, that, the, that interference uh, results in what we call an interferogram. And then we can interpret that and, and get shape information from that interferogram. And this will give you a better look of, of what we call the mirror under test. And this positioner allows for six degrees of freedom because we needed to position each of the segment types, A, B, or C, uh, very carefully in order to, to get uh, that interference that we're looking for in our optical test. Of course, this is early on. You would never be standing uh, uh, you know, near the optic um, during the actual test. Of course, the heat from your body would, would cause some trouble. But this is just an, Im an interesting image. And the Shag Hartman, that was another very clever metrology tool where we could actually measure the surface optically in the grind. As you know, it's, it's you know, grind, usually in a, if you're doing conventional uh, fabrication, you might have a spirometer or a CMM, but we were actually taking infrared sub-apertures and stitching them together to create a full surface map in the grind. So this was, this was also a very interesting approach uh, for early optical interferom interferometry uh, in, the, in the grind. And here are the real heroes in my book, the James Webb, the, the, the operations, uh, the hands people, as I call them. Um, they were the ones that were, that were you know, doing the day-to-day -day operations, whether it was grinding or polishing. They kept the machines moving three shifts a day, five days a week, as I said, 24-5. And of course, we did keep those cryo chambers going all weekend as well. So these are, these are my heroes right here. And uh, sometimes the brilliant protocols were stifling. I, I think I said to our safety, uh, our safety guy, I said they were inhumane. You know, I was trying to get some way that we could have some water, some container, some way that when we're out in the shop, we could actually, you know, keep ourselves safe, but have a drink, maybe a coffee. Uh, it never happened. I was told for literally for years that we're working on it. And uh, frankly, it just never happened. So here we see a cartoon of uh, the guys on third shift getting getting creative because you know uh, it is the nectar of the gods and on third shift that coffee is you, you kind of need it and anomalies the, the broader community was uh, really tied into mirror making especially when we had what we call an anomaly and depending on the severity of the problem we can always count on a healthy discussion 
uh, of the risks and corrective actions to follow. Uh, they would fly out quickly and it would be a, as shown here. Uh, now the cartoon is, is not quite accurate, but in the cartoon we have the Black Hawk helicopters hovering outside conference room, our, our main conference room. And it was always serious, but more often than not, um, we almost had a problem. And communication, this was uh, critical. Whenever anything happened, any anomaly occurred, we found out the hard way, uh, it's really important how you communicate it. Uh, as I like to say, we needed to avoid the pain that had not yet come. Um, hesitating was bad. Skipping a link in the chain was, was bad. Um, uh, but being honest and listening, uh, that was always good. But uh, by the time things got to NASA, uh, they were just convinced it was part safety critical and, and it, was, it was really hard to, to bring them back down to earth um, until we had a long discussion. Okay, bump in the night. Many of you that have worked on optics, I'm, I'm assuming uh, most of you have been working on it, like myself, they're working on glass or glass ceramic. And beryllium is a whole different creature. And there's so many things that, that are challenging, the toxicity, as I mentioned, micro yield, pitting, to name a few. But there was a few advantages. With glass, we got one chance, okay? And, uh, you know, it either, it either chips or fractures altogether. And as I like to say, with glass, you, if the stress exceeds the strength, you get a permanent record of the problem. Uh, with beryllium, it was much tougher. We often got uh, a second chance. As long as you avoided the thin ribs on the backside, you had a good chance of, as I say, getting to the other side of scary. So there was some advantages to beryllium. And I can talk about uh, the meteorite that, that hit uh, C3. That's also interesting. Uh, here's the secondary. Of course, uh, it's often overlooked, but you really do need a secondary. Here's this convex secondary mirror in grind, and you see, uh, uh, in, in figure grind, this is, um, it really paralleled the, the, the primary mirror segments. It had a small dedicated team uh, working just on the secondary. And early metrology of the secondary, you see a CMM, you got the Ruby probe uh, touching the surface. Even in the figure grind, we were, we were measuring that surface in the grind. And uh, we needed those mechanical measurements early. Of course, I also, as on the secondary, you also needed to measure the backside to manage stress. And here we see uh, some loose abrasive grinding. We see the secondary here on the machine. It, you can see it's, it's skirted up and we're finishing. Looks like we're getting near the finish of a smooth out grind run. And of course, note the swarf on the surface and manage that and be, keep ourselves safe. And here is a, a beautiful picture. Uh, with the secondary, it was small enough that we, we had a we had training and, and a dedicated team, and we did most of the most of the handling was done, frankly, by hand. And you see, there's only only a few people were were certified uh, to do that. But we see some senior technicians holding the secondary, and it's it's right in front of the metrology door, and we're getting ready to go take it on to the CMM, as you can see there. And here's a, a visualization in early smooth out grind, you see the secondary, and of course the, the color map, you can see some quilting in the middle, that's kind of interesting. You can also see there's a little bit of a high edge. Of course, remember, this is very early, so this is, don't get too excited. These, these, uh, these took us a couple of years to finish, but I just wanted to illustrate that we would work to surface maps uh, just to visualize the surface even early on. Here we see the secondary on a polishing machine. This is an intermediate size, sort of a medium size machine for us. Uh, and it was, uh, again, a dedicated machine. And you see the engineers discussing the run. And when that secondary was polished, it was a beautiful sight. And we can see here, when we got that surface polished, we would still do some CMM measurements, but it was starting to look really nice. And of course, once it was polished, it was available for an optical test. It had its own dedicated Kendall shell optical test, uh, test set that was also in the technology room. And here we see a lively discussion uh, between the process engineers. And you see the, uh, 
SSM as we call it, the secondary mirror polishing in the background. Of course, these are Photoshop. One of these is me, but it doesn't look like me. Um, and then once it was gold coated, I mean, this, this, the secondary, yeah, as you can see, this is just stunning. In my, in my world, this is, this is a beauty. And it's, you can see them, uh, you know, it might be a little photo op, but they're inspecting that, that secondary and they've got it, um, they've got it in a primary mirror a shipping container. So it's, it's kind of a special setup. They've, they've kind of uh, made allowances for the secondary to go in one of these large um, shipping containers. And here uh, is another view of that beautiful gold coated secondary. It's on isolators. There's all kinds of sophisticated uh, transport um, uh, details that you can't really go into, but it's, it's a very sophisticated to keep these uh, mirrors uh, safe. And also, uh, as, as I mentioned briefly earlier, there's a tertiary mirror. So light hits the third mirror, we call it a tertiary. And again, these were uh, dedicated, uh, a dedicated dedicated team, and, and they were trained uh, on handling the tertiary. This is just a foam ring with tissue paper, but they're they're very well trained and had a lot of practice. And of course, uh, the grinding of the tertiary that we actually did the, the tertiary on one of the large machines. So we 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 uh, took one of the large machines and dedicated it to the, the tertiary and keeping it going. And you can see a uh, smooth out grind pass here and use uh, on the next page, I'll show you some metrol early metrology. This is the tertiary, uh, it's concave. It's a, it's a free form a sphere. And here we have the tertiary on the CMM and you can see sort of, again, one of these height maps, you see some, some features that didn't last long because uh, we, this is early. So please remember, this is not the final this is this in process. And after it was finished, polished and coated, it was incredible. And this is an amazing shot straight out of the chamber. So this is the gold coating straight out of the chamber. That tertiary is basically, as far as the mirror element, is ready to go. And then they're starting to integrate it into uh, flight structure here. So you see the tertiary uh, some of that integration. And uh, just a little talk on the shipping. Like I mentioned earlier, when we, we ship uh, mirrors from to the XRCF, that's the chamber that goes to cryo, so we can get that cryo back out. This was a big day. And also keep in mind, because these were very valuable, we would ship one segment in a trailer. So imagine a semi, uh, a giant truck with a, with a giant trailer. There's one segment in there. We could not risk two in the same truck. We, it's not going to happen. It wasn't allowed, frankly. So we had we had insured these. Uh, well, I should say we, but they were insured for thirty million dollars a piece. And then, of course, th then later on, we had more sophisticated uh, shipping containers. It almost looks to me like a, a re-entry vehicle. I'll show you on the next page. It's 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 quite a. These these were these were beautiful shipping containers for critical space flight hardware. These are primary mirror segments. Each one has its own beautiful, amazing shipping container. You can see we're in a clean room at this point. And here we see the, the web mirrors. These are, this kind of give you some perspective. We had 18 of the primaries. Now, of course, remember we had an extra A, an extra B and an extra C. So we did, we did fabricate extras of the primary mirror. So we had really 21 that were, that were good, frankly. Uh, we had one secondary and we had one tertiary as shown here. And these are just incredible, for me, incredible beauty shots. Of course, once they, once they got coded and, and, and tested, I mean, it, it, you know, it kind of put things in, in perspective of, of what, you know, how they tied into the observatory and the mission they were a part, big part of. And again, just a, a beauty shot of an individual. I don't know which segment this is, but it's individual segment. We, we got to know the segments almost because they each were kind of were like family. We kind of, you know, had a personal history. We knew, you know, all the trials and tribulations of, of the segments themselves. And this is an interesting uh, photo. Uh, this is, I'm, I don't know the full story on this, but this is... Um, Two different things we got on the right side that's beryllium that's a direct 
brilliant polished surface. And after the gold coating, you can see, well, it's quite, quite different. They're both quite beautiful, but um, this will give you an idea of after the coating, uh, when gold coating went on there, um, it changed them, it made them, I think, even more beautiful. And this is kind of a dramatic picture in the XRCF. Uh, it's got a double shrouded um, nitrogen and helium shroud to get down to the 40 Kelvin so that they could be tested. And the backouts developed uh, what I remember what I called the cryogenic backouts. And this is a more fully integrated uh, observatory getting ready to go in this giant. Um, giant chamber. I, honestly, I, I wasn't there. So I, I just found this kind of, you know, hard to wrap my head around. Okay. And I'd just like to say that uh, this presentation is dedicated to what I call the Websters. That's the hands people, the technicians, metrologists, and process engineers. And I say, we built the heart of the world's greatest observatory. And we devoted ourselves to JWST and the cosmos. And I want to thank you very much. And should I stop sharing? Do we, do we does anybody have any questions or? We can continue to share if anything would be helpful referential for questions. But I'd just like to say that was a phenomenal talk. I'm sure a lot of the concepts are familiar for some amateurs, small mirror grinding. So I'm sure we'll have some excellent questions. Got one for Mario. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay, great. Excellent talk. Thank you. Two, two questions. One, uh, as you alluded to, beryllium is a horrible material if you breathe it in. It's, it's actually a fatal illness for the lungs. So I, I noticed when in the grinding and polishing room, many people didn't have masks or respirators on. How did you keep them from getting sick? Well, yeah, let me explain that. That's a perfectly, that's a great point. First of all, we are all very scared of our exposure to beryllium. And we spent the first, the better part of a year in the beginning wearing these respirators that we call PAMs or personal uh, air monitoring systems. And they had these little filters on them that we would send out to the lab and get diagnosed. Anyway, basically we proceduralized uh, the processes uh, at some point, we were, there was no exposure to beryllium that was detectable. And uh, in addition, as I mentioned, we would have these periodic blood tests to see if, if we had any proclivity, any, any sensitivity that was developing uh, before we even had symptoms. They could, they could see that in, our, in, our, in the blood tests. And so we kept a very good track of it. We only had one person over the life of the program that we really had to pull off and he had to go work on, you know, other things. Uh, but out of, let's just say 50 people included, you know, engineers and, and metrologists and, and the like, we, we had just the one person uh, that had any, any sensitivity at all. But basically uh, it, took, it took a huge amount of effort to determine uh, what processes were safe. Now, some of the processes you didn't see, we were wearing full up respirators because they were more risky. They were more hazardous. And during those processes, we, you better believe we were fully garbed up with what we call the PPEs. I hope that well, that's what I was concerned about. So in the grinding, at least the grinding stages, I got to imagine you had some beryllium. <laughs> you know, we did not, we did not essentially, uh, it was not measurable. The, Everything, the way we managed it and, and kept everything wet. So the beryllium particles stayed wet, stayed in the pan, and we kept it wet. And we had a, a process for very quickly and carefully removing that. Um, some of these operations, we, as I said, we would, wear, um, we would wear respirators. But for the most part, we um, proceduralized out and mitigated the risk with, with uh, keeping things wet, basically. May I ask a second question? Sure. So the, the micrometeorite that we heard about uh, two months ago, how much damage did it do? Haven't heard anything more since. Okay, can I, I can tell you. Um, I talked to, um, um, I, I don't think I should use his name, but I talked to a NASA guy. He's still on the program. He's very, very, uh, very uh, much still in the middle of things. And he told me that the, the local damage to what I'm calling segment C3, 
Okay, this is a C type segment C3. There was a local uh, spot, maybe the size of your fist, that was that was a local uh, locally deformed. Uh, in addition, there was some uh, global bending, if you will, even though that's very stiff and very strong. Uh, there was some global bending. You might, in, in terms of what I call Zernike's, it looked like astigmatism, okay, a potato chip. So uh, if it's a small enough manageable amount of astigmatism, there's a, uh, a hexapod on the back, and they can basically align some of these low order shapes can be aligned out. So basically the effect on the telescope, there was, there's a small spot that, that's, you know, that's not great anymore, but, but most of the mirror, I mean, 90, 90, 95, 98% of that mirror is still, uh, you know, is still very much um, co-phased with the rest of the, of the rest of the 17 segments. You had an active optic in the back of it that, that, that took out the deformity? Yeah, there's, there's a simple, this is, this is a relatively simple in, in telescope terms, way to, they can do from the earth, we can bend out the shapes as necessary. So it's not just positioning, uh, we can, I mean, most of it's positioning. We, we can uh, position the segment in order to, to minimize uh, the out of shape nature of it, but there is some local uh, radius of curvature ability. There is a very simple device that can actually, you know, provide for a uh, radius of curvature or, or if you will, power adjustment. So, uh, so I'm, co I'm concerned about, I'm concerned about meteorites hitting, uh, you know, there's not much we can do. Um, um, and we, we hope that that was, you know, maybe one of the more significant uh, um, events. And we hope it's not that common. There's been some smaller events that have occurred uh, also, but they, they were really inconsequential according to what I've heard. Got a question from Phil. Uh, so thank you very much for interesting talk. Um, I, I'm curious about um, the grinding and the polishing was done in room temperature. And then the segments were sent out in a, to a cryo chamber to check for mirror accuracy. So how could you, I guess there was some kind of software to predict the room temperature quality as it would appear in uh, the colder temperature in space. Um, so I'm curious yeah. How that, yeah. How, yeah, let, yeah, let me explain, I think, I think to be clear, there was a very good measurement, optical measurement made at room temperature. And then there was a very good measurement made at cryo temperatures. And both of these are interferom interferometric CGH, CGH tests. And then if you look at the delta or the change in that surface, and, go, and the only thing you've done to it is go from room temperature to cryo temperature, you saw a repeatable uh, segment specific surface figure change and we call that the cryo back out. So for segment A3, it had a signature back out that was just for A3. And we would get that from a delta, basically room temperature measure, and then cryo measure, take a subtraction, you get a delta, that would be the applied back out for that cryogenic back out. There's a question from Mark, is it? Yep. Hi there. Great, great talk. Um, the uh, individual segments were they made specifically to go in? I, I, I might not have understood you. In the A, B, C, like one, two, three, were they made as A one, B one, C one, um, or were they? Did you figure out which mirror pieces were the best, at, at, and then? Get them together at the end, and then I have one other quick question. Okay, well, you you ask a very good, insightful question. the The segments themselves were in the beginning were designed to be, you know, either A's, B's, or C's, and in theory, those would be um, interchangeable. Now, as you alluded to, in when when things got you know down to the nanometer type uh, level there might be a better fit, you know, what we called C2 might have fit better in the C4 position, you know, in terms of co-phasing with its neighbors. 
And so, you know, we associated uh, a segment number and we kept, you know, we always thought C3 was C3. And then I find, I, you know, I find out later that, you know, NASA renumbered them. <laughs> so the, the markings on the side of the beryllium said, this is C3. And so we thought, well, that's C3, right? And it's always going to be C3. But in, in order, as you allude to, uh, when once those final surfaces were created, C3 might have fit better in the C4 position, for instance. Yeah. And my, my other quick question is, the, uh, where is the tertiary mirror? I didn't see that. And what is the, is that a mirror that's sending uh, light or other wave, wavelengths to, enough, to other instruments? Is that what the tertiary mirror does? And where in well, the optical chain is that? Well, I'm not an expert on this, but essentially the tertiary is, uh, let me see, I wonder if you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse? I saw it for a second. Oh. I don't see it anymore. Or, wait, 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 maybe. This tertiary is kind of in, this tertiary is kind of in here. I, I, I'm not an expert on, on this, to be honest. The tertiary is, like I said, a general A sphere, it's concave. And of course the fine steering mirror uh, will be that last, uh, it's last bounce to instruments, right? So you have to redirect uh, the telescope to, you know, whether it was near Cam or Miri, and that, that's my understanding at least. I'm not an expert on that, to be fair. Yeah. Are, there, are there any questions from Zoom? Yeah, there's, there's I, one. Yeah. I, I have a question, which is you alluded to um, the uh, Grinding and polishing in 1G, but having to compensate for 0G, and how do you do that? Okay, that's a, that's a super good question. And the, the, the answer is we have very, very detailed models of each and every segment, including rib thicknesses. And, and, and we took that finite element model to the next level. So we had... Uh, each, each one of these was segment specific finite element um, models that were me measured, you know, based on measured measurements, uh, CMM measurements. And we believe that the, uh, the structure was known and the models were good to probably within 5%. And then based on that, we would apply, you know, gravity and, and the support condition in the 1G to, to, to predict you know, the surface figure change due to gravity. And you think, well, this is beryllium. It's very stiff. What, what could that do? Well, in our world, it was huge. Gravity was, I, I, I'm not sure I know, remember the numbers, but the gravity back out was a giant number. Um, in our world, in our nanometer world, it was, it was significant. And we, again, the, they were segment-specific uh, finite element models. Uh, and I, I, I think we, we have a pretty good understanding that the models, the gravity had some uncertainty on it, the gravity back out, probably, I'm going to say 10% on the gravity back out. And do you know how it worked out in space? I mean, obviously the images are amazing, but it, it was a, can you tell whether it was as predicted? I don't know, except to say that, you know, they're, as you said, you know, the diffraction limited, you know, sort of exceeding exceeding our expectations, but I don't, you know, I don't know the short answer. <laughs> I, 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 what we did, what we had our requirements and frankly, you know, we did everything humanly possible to do better than that. So we didn't stop when it was done. It wasn't good enough. We just, we just kept going until they pulled it away from us. You know, we know we didn't, we didn't want to stop. We were trained to be, be like that. Question from Christine. Yeah, hi, thank you for um, speaking. Um, I had a question, perhaps I don't understand some of the process, but when you sent the mirrors to be interferometry uh, tested on the big granite slabs and with the optical equipment, were those, were the, was the testing equipment itself um, prepared specially just for the James Webb? Because it seems to me that the, the precision of polishing for the web is was far beyond the precision of the testing equipment itself. Yes, yeah, so this is custom made from the ground up, and, and as you suggest, this was this was not a trivial pursuit. I mean, this was incredible. We pushed everything as far as we could in terms of it. 
even in the beginning, as I showed you what I call the robotic aligner on, on the front side, just the six degree of freedom positioning of an A, a B, or a C was, you know, very precise, interferometrically driven. We, I, I mean, it, there's a lot of details and, and subtleties in it. But yeah, we took things as far as we could, as far as uh, humanly possible in terms of um, the refinement of the of the CGH optical test. So yeah, it was it was quite 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 refined. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Is there a question from Mark? Yeah, sorry to uh, just one more. I don't know if you can answer this, but I've been interested in the fact that the telescope side is near absolute zero. The sunlit side is around 200 degrees. And although you got the insulation in between, is a connection between the scope and the, uh, the, the transmitter on the other side and the power sources. So how does, how you keep heat leakage from getting to the instruments through that uh, when they're connected? Um, I don't know. The straight answer is I don't know. Um, yeah, okay. you're asking an extremely good question that I wish I could answer. I just don't know. I, I'm only, I'm only, I'm only, uh, I, I'm limited in what I know. I, I know about the mirror polishing, but I, I don't really think I understand the big picture on that. Thank you for the question. I, I, I don't know. I've got a question on the support. Uh, I know for amateurs, especially for thin mirrors or lightweight mirrors, the print through or quilting, like you say, is, is an issue. And also mm. the support for very, very lightweight mirrors is very critical in operation, mm. but also in fabrication and having the support during fabrication match the support in application and deployment. What kind of uh, kind of system did you use during grinding or how much collaboration was there from the space flight hardware to your grinding hardware that you use to support the mirrors during grinding and tests and that it's very complicated support. The, the servos yeah. from steering that they have. Yeah, we, we understood we understood um, our supports very well. And and then of course, you know, um, the other tiered partners, Ball and, and others would 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 take it to the next level and integrate it with the, with the other supports. Um, but we had a we had a, on our side we had a, a very good understanding of how to finesse in the surface figure. And as you as you expect, we saw there's some very subtle things that basically weren't you know we couldn't have in these mirrors. Some of that quilting that's all been polished out. Okay, so so the besides the you know accounting for you know the surface figure from you know cryogenic backouts and gravity backouts, we also had to take out all those you know what we call mid spatial surface frequencies and uh, get those out as well so the the mounts um yeah we had to we had to account for that too and, and it was mostly um a modeled response a question from eileen were you also given pieces of material beryllium to practice on yes yes that's a good question um we had practice material we had a, a heritage uh, an understanding of, of beryllium. But the thing that was really important for us, uh, since you asked the question, was coupons. And so what, you know, it's, it's, it's not a lightweighted beryllium segment, but what it is, is it's, it's something you can measure, you can fabricate, so you can grind and polish and measure. And the thing that was really important in, for me was understanding the micro yield. So you know that if you go to a loose abrasive grind on, on this material, that the just from the loose abrasive uh, processes, you're establishing um, stresses in the material that exceed, as I said, the micro yield limit. And you need to understand uh, those stresses, how deep they are, and how essentially to, to, to remove those in the uh, cryothermal chamber. So Using those coupons, uh, you know, would help us with removal rates, uh, subsurface damage, uh, establishing the, uh, you know, the series of, of, of abr abrasives that would be applied and polishing mechanisms and, and pitting and all of, all of those things. Uh, we, again, we would do on smaller coupons in the very beginning. 
And of course, um, our, as I mentioned, the process uh, pathfinder that we call the engineering development unit or the EDU, that was also on the forefront of, of all of these parameters to try to mitigate the risk before we got to, you know, what we call the production segments. So we're very important to have uh, some test pieces. One more question from Mark. Last, last question from me. Uh, the, the beveling you talked about at the edges of the, each of the segments. So there, I guess there's space, a slight space between each of the segments and then the mechanism behind the segments creates the parabola. Is that correct? So the beveling became important or are they far enough apart separated enough that when the mechanism creates the parabola so they're they're each flat segments i take it and then that no 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 let, yeah let me let me explain a little bit i i i'm, I'm the segments have a significant uh sagitta or depth of curve to them so these are 15 meter radius of curvature rough numbers 15.9 meter radius of curvature um a spheres and they are, you know, each has an, you know, each has got an optical, um, you know, an off-axis distance of some number for an A, a B, and a C. And so the 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 perturbing of that, the positioning with the hexapod on the back, was mostly for positioning because they're already essentially, um, you know, nearly perfect segments within, say, 20 nanometers of their prescriptive shape. Uh, the only thing we we have very small controls on radius of curvature. And mostly positioning. We we don't have a, a an ability to to uh, to bend in a lot of you know actively bend in a lot of other corrections you know other as we would say in in optics you know zernike. So if we needed to put in coma or we need to put in you know uh, a hexafoil or something. We wouldn't be able to do that. Okay, I hope that you. helps. A lot. Thank you. Hey, Kenneth Lani has a question. A question on Zoom from Ken. Sure, I, I have um, two. One, I think, is a quick question. I assume a clarification that the segments are non-rotational. Uh, in other words, they're not symmetrical all the way around, so it's not like a conventional mirror because they're so far off-axis. Yeah, you got it. These are off-axis A-spheres. So as you said, the, the, you know, the parent, you know, of course, looking at the parent, that is, is nearly parabolic, slightly hyperbolic, but it's it's a... It's got a radius and a conic, and, and it's basically, you know, an off-axis hexagonal cookie cutter of that parent. So, yeah, you're right. They're, they're absolutely not rotationally symmetric. So we had to, of course, there's a clocking feature here, right? So uh, A1 only went in one position. It did, you know, we have an OAD or an off-axis distance, and, of course, it had to be clocked very precisely. If you misclock, now misclocking would be bad because if you misclock, an A sphere like that, you're going to see some low order surface figure like mostly astigmatism, right? So yeah, they're not rotationally symmetric, uh, and they were clocked and very specifically oriented to be a part of that parent. Thank you. And the other half of my question was a slightly different one involving the mirror uh, substrate. We have a couple of club members who have fabricated brilliant mirrors for some of the uh, space. Um, well, Voyager, among others. And um, oh, wow. one, nice. one, of the, one of the things that um, I recall was that they were uh, polishing on nickel. So in other words, they nickel plated and then did the um, figuring. But I gather you went right directly on the beryllium. That's uh, impressive. <laughs> yeah, the, the nickel, I mean, I would, I would, Frank, I mean, Nickel's got some challenges, right? Because you now have a bimetallic. So you, the CTE and there's some funny things happening because you've got two metals, right? Yeah. However, if you ask if you ask me, do you want to polish nickel or do you want to polish beryllium? Oh, I'll give me nickel. I'll just give me nickel, please. Because beryllium, we have there's some challenges, right? This is a centered, this is a hipped material and there's grain boundaries, right? So, you know, if you look closely at this, th this is, you know. O30 brilliant powder that's been hipped and all these things. But if you look really, really closely, there's a, a minuscule grain boundary. And so it's, it's a very difficult to polish directly, but that's, that's what we did. So it's just one material. It's, a, it's basically nearly pure beryllium, very little beryllium oxide, nearly pure. 
and polish correctly. And you're right, I I don't have experience uh, that much experience polishing um, uh, nickel, but but I I would you know if you ask me, I'd like to polish glass because that's that's what I'm used to. <laughs> I'm comfortable with glass and glass ceramics. So, but anyway, this had its own challenges. Direct polishing of this of this metal, and by the way, it's toxic. So <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I'm sure part of the reason for the nickel plating or nickel coating was to reduce the toxicity, but also because it, it's an easier surface. I, I'm impressed that you were able to get such a surface on uh, bare metal like that. So it's, yeah, it's um, well you know, done. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. It was it was tough. And to be fair, um, the surfaces, the requirement on the surface roughness was 40 angstroms RMS. So if you've polished mirrors, you've probably done better than that. You've probably got some mirrors that are five or 10 or, or better Angstrom's RMS. So these, because of, of the nature of the material, um, 40, 40 uh, was about, about the best we could do, 30 to 40 um, Angstrom's RMS. So it is, it is challenging. Thank you. Gives you a little bit of favor. <laughs> Is there another question? Yeah, I have one more for you. Um, well, that's me personally, but with a lot of these space um, projects, NASA usually specs a second, um, not to say prototype, but an Earth-based um, model so they can, you know, diagnose or work any problems here on Earth and, you know, send information back up to the space-based thing. Is there a second James Webb that's, Earth-based somewhere, not to add to your workload, but you kind of mentioned that there was only one extra segment that was made for each of the um, the A, B, and C units, but or uh, banks. But um, yeah. So is there a second James Webb somewhere? Uh, there is not. I mean, you know, we had the as you as you probably know with the Hubble, there was there was a Hubble mirror, right? And we all know this. I think we know the story about that. We also know, maybe you don't know, or maybe you do know, that there was a backup mirror made for the Hubble that's now in the Smithsonian. It was made by my colleagues um, at Kodak, and um, I know some of the people that, that worked on it. I didn't work on it, um, but uh, there is no, to my knowledge, um, there is no backup web sitting anywhere. The the beryllium is 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 difficult, challenging, expensive, and and uh, there's there's one of these. Now the thing about the the segments. Um, we had the extra one extra A, a B, and a C. Now the A was actually the EDU. The EDU was a type A segment, and it was our backup, if you will, for the A type. We had a B and a C. Now the thing that was interesting is, uh, in terms of backup mirrors, was secondary and tertiary. Um, there really wasn't any uh, backup segments that were fully um, machined and ready to go and become the secondary if we had some catastrophic issue with the secondary. What we did have, or what NASA judged was, you know, a reasonable risk was we did have material set aside that if we ever did need to make another secondary or tertiary, we had that material available to us that we could, you know, do it on, on a fast process because but, you know, to my knowledge, we had one secondary, we made one secondary, we made one tertiary. Uh, the blanks were just in our imagination and, and, and a big pool of material somewhere else uh, if we needed it. And we think, thank goodness we didn't need it. Uh, but we did have an extra A, B, and a C um, for, for the primary mirror segments, which, of course, is the preponderance of the area for the observatory. Thank you. Dave Rust on Zoom. Another question from Zoom. Dave, you have your hand up. Oh, yes. Um, I apologize. I'm a late arrival in case there is a redundant question here. But I wondered about the mirror's tolerance for pitting. Is there a threshold at some point where the damage would inhibit data value? And, um, and is it possible to remove an entire mirror section from service to preserve the remaining data value? Wow, wow! I can tell you're you're, you're a nerd, uh, but yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, here, here's the thing about pitting: we were perfectionists, and we it bothered us to see a pit. I mean, one microscopic pit would be you know a millionth of a percent of the of the of the segment, and we would freak out over it. And we, would, we were driven to try to solve the problem. 
the, the problem with the pitting, we were so extra careful with the polishing chemistry that we essentially spent extra time because we didn't want to push things into the risk zone for pitting. So, um, but we don't have any cases in the telescope where we, as you said, maybe we would want to remove some material and just kind of take it out of, out of, uh, out of the optical path or, you know, basically blacken it, if you will, or, or do something like that. So there's nothing like that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak to how many pits are in, in, in JWST, but let me just say there's a lot of surface area and these pits are extremely small, if, if, if any. I, I shouldn't really speak on that. <laughs> I think that's it for questions. I want to thank you so much for giving this talk to our club. It's such an incredible opportunity to hear firsthand from someone directly involved in the creation of these mirrors. It's a phenomenal talk. Thank you. Thank you very well, much. I'm, I'm, thank you so much. I'm just so proud to talk to you guys. You guys are super interesting. And um, I just I think you're a great group. And I do really appreciate being able to share the story with you. It does my heart good, and uh, it was it was a great effort. And I'm glad we could share it with you. Thank you so much. Okay. Should I stop sharing? I can, okay. I've got, so I'll uh, officially close the meeting. So okay. I just want to remind everyone that the next meeting is Thursday, November 10th. And we have a board meeting coming up October 27th.